one of the greatest schisms that happened in the Islamic uh, community was the split that basically gave us what's today is Sunnis and Shias. And these terms themselves are problematic because there are different types of Shias and there are different types of Sunnis. And the whole issue began as a political split where the companions had a, an issue uh, with regards to um, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib عنه, and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan عنه, and basically determining whether they want to get retribution for the killers of Uthman bin Affan عنه. it's a political situation that happened at the time um, but we have an extreme in the way that uh, both Sunnis and Shias, some Shias and some Sunnis take things the way some Sunnis look at the companions they elevate them to infallibility they're infallible as if they're prophets which they're not we have examples of verses in the Quran revealed on the account of some of the actions of the companions that were bad and so Allah is telling us in the Quran I mean the bit the, the most direct one is in Surah Al-Hujurat Ya alladheena amanu in ja'akum fasiqun bi naba'in fatabayyanu O you who believe if an open sinner comes to you with a piece of news then confirm it first. Who's that fasiq that Allah is talking about? It's al Walid ibn Uqba, one of the companions. And our, why that verse was developed is a different discussion, but just to show that the companions were human beings. Now, these people were chosen by God to be the companions of the Prophet. So automatically, they're better than us. As human beings, they're, just, they're in a different state. Their station, their internal state, is in a higher state. They were ready to become... The, le the ones that would transmit this religion to us. So there's no discussion about me them being less, like being le not, not fallible, meaning that they're lowered in status. Their status is still high. But they're still fallible, and we have to recognize that. And they had issues, they had disagreements, they fought with each other. Some Shia, unfortunately, what they do is they go to another extreme and they want to completely insult, negate, ignore, yada yada. You know, they just negate them completely. But these are minorities in either way. Um, if you listen to a lot of Shia, they don't have the image that some Muslims have made of them. They don't have that uh, attitude towards the companions. And even their texts, um, you go to some of their texts, you can find some very horrendous things written in their texts, but even they don't accept these things. But it's just part of the transmission that they have them recorded. So if you don't have a methodology, when you approach their texts, you might come across some things and think that they believe them when they don't. It's just like Sunnis, we have things in our texts, we know they're fabricated. But the only way for you to know they're fabricated is to sit down with Sunni teachers to tell you, you're going to find this in this book, it's a very weak thing, we don't actually accept this. The Shia have the same thing. We have to give them that, that respect. Now, there are a couple of ways to looking at history. One way to look at history is to want to take a position where you're going to be supporting one group against another group and determining who was right and who was wrong so that you can take a side. That right there is a sectarian mind. That mind is actually a, a frivolous mind. That is not a mind that is going to bring any good pro or prosperity to Muslims or anybody else because that person is not looking to progress. They're looking to just regress. Moreover, when, it, when you look at history, you have to really be careful because especially with political history because you're getting one point of view you're getting a perspective of that author to that what to what happened so you can't completely just believe everything and just go along with it with their point of view so you have to pause back for a minute the way, the other way to look at history which is really the proper way to look at history is that you look at what happened not because you want to take a side but because you want to learn from what happened you want to see what happened with, let's say, the situation between Ali and Muawiyah and Radullah uh, Anhum, and why, why did they fight and what was going on? You want to ascertain lessons from that situation so that you don't repeat that mistake again today. A lot of the things that human beings do nowadays, especially in politics, if you know the history of man, you'll be surprised how much of it is just getting repeated because people don't learn from their past mistakes. We don't read history anymore. So, to take the position of, 
oh, let's just ignore what the companions did and let's just have a good opinion of them. Yeah, I have a good opinion of the companions, but I still want to know what happened. And I want to read the history, not because I want to be against somebody. I just want to learn the lessons so that we can move on and progress and not fall into the same mistakes. Allah says in the Quran, God says in the Quran, فَتَقَطَّعُوا أَمْرَهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ زُبُرًا كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ They have split amongst themselves into various sects and each sect is happy and joyous with what they have. And the term that Allah uses in the Quran, فَرِحُونَ Joyous, joyful, it's an emotional state. You're just with the group. It's almost like two teams playing against, two teams playing against each other. You know, and you siding with one team in sports, right? That's an emotional state. You're not being rational. You're using emotions, instincts, things like primal motives. When it comes to delivering the Islamic message and trying to teach people and elevate, and do, you have to be using rational powers. So to come with the idea that, oh, this person is Shia, so I'm not going to listen to them. And we see that all the time. You know, Once you hear someone's sect, you find a lot of people discount that person. And it no longer matters what they have to say, which is so bad. Because this Islamic tradition has so many things, is so rich with so many con valuable contributions of people. Our past scholars, Imam Shafi'i was accused of being Shia, by the way. Um, we have a Sunni writing against Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, who is a Sunni. And we have a Shi'i writing in support of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. So our past scholars were not this sectarian about things. They focused more on the message. Imam al-Bukhari has Shia in his text, in his Sahih, in his collection of Hadith, that he's narrating from. People who were known to be Shia. So what's the deal here? It's not about what sect you belong to. We want to examine what you have to say and see if it's true or not. And that's what matters. That's what makes us progress. Now, even among Sunnis, uh, let's take something like theological schools, not just Shia and Sunni, but even with uh, Sunnis. We have the theological schools of, say, the Ash'ari and the, and the Maturidi, which is the majority of Sunnis. And then you have the Athari, which is what modern-day Salafis claim to follow. Now, if you're talking to, let's say, uh, someone who's a non-Muslim, and they want to, and they're interested in Islam, you can't tell him God and his messenger said, if they don't believe in that. They want to first believe that God exists, let's say, right? You can't come and say, God says, well, he doesn't even believe in God. You can't tell him Muhammad says because he doesn't even believe in the Messenger of Muhammad. So what do you have to do? That person needs philosophy. They need argumentation. They need a debate. They need a discussion. And for that, unfortunately, the Salafi is unable to engage because for the Salafis, they hate philosophy. They follow the teachings of, let's say, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah. They take some of his words against philosophy and they say, this is just heretical. We're not going to engage in this. Even though Imam Ibn Taymiyyah himself says, if someone needs philosophy... To, be ad to address their issues, then it's okay for you to use philosophy. L put that aside. Now you have the, the Ash'ari Maturidi and then you have the Mu'tazila, you know, at the ra with the so-called rationalist school. But they're all rationalists. It's just they have different approaches to what the intellect's role is with regards to revelation. They have different positions on them. But before we get into that, they all agree on a foundational thing. They all agree on La ilaha illallah. There is only one God worthy of worship. And they all agree that Muhammad is a messenger of God. They all agree on the basics, the principles of our creed, you know, belief in the angels, belief in the de divine decree, belief in uh, the hereafter. They all accept all of these premises. Where they disagree is in what's called branches of aqidah, branches of creed. Things where now the human intellect is being exercised so that they can come up with answers to difficult theological questions. And sometimes they disagree a lot of times they agreed. Now, because people differ in intellects, they differ in intellectual powers, they differ in their backgrounds, even their educational backgrounds, they differ in their ex life experience, uh, they differ in even those that want to convert, let's say, they come from different uh, religions. Some people, the arguments of the Mu'tazila, for example, may work. And the Ash'ari may not work. They may not convince them with some of the things. My question is, let's, I'm an Ash'ari, for example, I follow the Ash'ari Aqidah, because that's, it makes the most sense to me. I, I find it the most rational and the most consistent one. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to use a Mu'tazila argument that I may disagree with, but it's there and it's on our tradition, and it may convince someone else. 
why would I deprive someone from entering Islam? Because I want them not to enter Islam, I want them to enter my type of Islam. That's a problem. It's not my type of Islam, it's Islam that I want them to enter. And if Islam has options, it has things to offer that would allow someone to go, this makes sense, I agree with this. They can go with the Mu'tazili opinion. You know what, I would rather have someone be a Mu'tazili than be an atheist. But unfortunately for a lot of us today, they don't go with that. They would rather have someone not be a Muslim than be the wrong type of Muslim. I'm totally okay with someone entering Islam and be a Shia than not enter Islam at all. Because at least we all share what the Prophet Muhammad actually said, مَنْ صَلَّى صَلَاتَنَا وَاسْتَقْبَلَ قِبْلَتَنَا وَهُوَ أَكَلَ ذَبِحَتَنَا فَهُوَ مِنَّا Whoever prays our prayer, prays to the direction of Mecca like we do, and eats our slaughtered meat, he's from us. So even the Prophet Muhammad is telling us, simplify the basics, keep the basics, the principles, keep them simple. Don't excommunicate people because of these things. Like We all share in these basic foundations. The Mu'tazila started because Wasil ibn Ata' was a student of Hassan al-Basri in Baghdad. And Hassan al-Basri was sitting and they were discussing some issues and Wasil ibn Ata' disagreed with him. So he went and he sat in another pillar and he started having his own gathering. And Al-Hasan al-Basri said, I'tazalana. He left us. And that's why the Mu'tazila got their name, Al-Mu'tazila. So, but he didn't say, oh, he left Islam, this heretic, this zandiq, you know, how dare he do this? And He didn't do that. And all of these things arose, you know, the Sahaba never talked about this. Yeah, they never did because they, it didn't, they were not issues that they needed to address. The Islam, the Islam that they were introduced to was dealing with polytheism, was dealing with things that they were dealing with. But the principles of the religion and the things that it can offer, it allows people with various intellects to extract things from the Qur'an and to extract things from the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad that allows them to address new matters. An example of that is when Islam started to spread to Persia, to spread to Rome, they started meeting with Christians and started to meet with Zoroastrians and people who studied Greek philosophy and they came to them and they started asking them questions. These questions the Sahaba never got. So they never got the chance to even address these things. It was Imam Abu Hanifa who started addressing these people and he's the first one from as far as I can tell to have tried to, uh, who has debated atheists. And he used to do it in the masjid in Baghdad. I used to tell the atheists, come and tell us, what do you got? And there's many stories about some of the debates that he used to have. So, again, you might need to use a tool that you may not need, but someone else needs. Accept it as is. And once you see the diversity of Islam like that, and recognize what is foundational as a principal affair, and what is a branch that can allow for difference in opinion, Sectarianism will melt away because you will just look at it as I differ with you. I disagree with you. This doesn't make sense to me. And we should be okay with that. And until we as a Muslim community get to the point of differing and being okay with it, I'll tell you an example of a difference that happened during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, Ka'b ibn Malik came to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he didn't come to the Prophet Muhammad. It was Umar ibn Khattab. He was praying behind Ka'b ibn Malik. And he heard him recite the Qur'an. I mean, you can't get, this is not even discussing side issues of theology. This is Qur'an now. And Ka'b ibn Malik was reciting Qur'an and he recited it differently than what Umar knew. He didn't recognize what he was hearing. So after the prayer, Umar grabbed him, radiallahu anhu, and he said, where did you hear this? And he said, I heard it from the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, well, I heard the same verses from the Messenger and it wasn't like this. And he basically treated him as if like, what are you trying to do? Change the religion? Change the Qur'an? So he dragged him to the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he tried to get, and he asked the Messenger, O oh, Messenger of God, Ka'bun Malik is reciting this Qur'an totally differently. He's, basically what he's saying is, he's trying to change the religion. The Prophet Muhammad calmed him down. And he said, Ka'b, you recite what you recited. Ka'b recited it. Umar ibn Khattab, you recite. Umar recited the same verses, but the way he learned them. The Prophet Muhammad said, Hakada unzilat wa hakada unzilat. It was revealed like this and it was revealed like that. The Quran itself has 
variant recitations. It's the same Quran, but the way that it's recited can change. And all of these came from the same source. It's not even ijtihad. This is not someone's effort. The Prophet Muhammad gave it like that. So if he allowed, and if he received the message of the Quran, and in these recitations, by the way, it should be known, although it's the same Quran, the one word, for example, in Surah Al-Fatiha, if you read it in Hafs an Asim, one recitation, you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahman Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. Or in Warsh an Nafi' you read, Maliki Yawmiddin. Maliki Yawmiddin or Maliki Yawmiddin. Malik, in Arabic, means the possessor, the owner. Malik means the king. So both of these recitations, they have different meanings using the same word, but just the way that it's recited is different. That recitation gives you two different meanings that are along the same, uh, rotating around the same type of idea, but it expands the meaning of the Qur'an that way. And that's with the Qur'an. So look at that and Tell me how can we not accept our differences in opinions when it comes to things that we have just exercised our own intellect in and come to different conclusions. My perspective of science, I do neuroscience, my perspective of science is a little bit different than someone who comes from a physics background, for example, which is going to be a little bit different. We're all talking about the same thing and we all have the same general scheme. We know what science is. But our perspective of it, because of the type of science that we each do and the type of uncertainties we each deal with, we have a different angle that we're looking at it. So, but we all talk about the same thing and we all agree on foundational principles of this, of this discipline. The same thing goes with Islam. Recognize what's foundational and what's principal and recognize what's a branch and where we can differ. But to do that, you need knowledge. You need to sit down with teachers and they can tell you what you need to know. And it's actually not that difficult.